With us in studio is author, producer, and casting director Bonnie Gillespie. Bonnie specializes in casting SAG indie fi- feature films. She writes a weekly column entitled The Actor's Voice on Showfacts.com. Bonnie has also written several books entitled Casting Cues, a collection of casting director interviews, self-management for actors, getting down to show business, and acting cues, conversations with working actors. Welcome to the Film Courage Studio, Miss Bonnie Gillespie. Welcome, Bonnie. Thank you. Thank you both for having me. I appreciate it. To see some of Bonnie's work, please visit cricketfeet.com, somebodysbasement.com, youractormba.com, and hollywoodhappyarrow.com. So let's start out, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And when did you realize that the corporate 9-to-5 world wasn't for you? I don't know that I ever actually experienced the corporate 9-to-5 world. I uh, I was a kid actor, so I always uh, knew I wanted to work in the arts. Uh, I thought it was going to be on camera, on stage. And then when I moved out to Los Angeles, I, I quickly learned that writing was going to pay the bills a lot better than acting, which is weird because being a, a full-time writer, you know, being a self-sustaining writer in the entertainment industry is actually sometimes harder to do than being a working actor. So I was very lucky that that, uh, that turned out to be true for me. Uh, and getting into casting came through my writing because I interviewed over 250 casting directors for my column in Backstage West back from 99 to 2003. And uh, and so in interviewing all these casting directors, I kept thinking, man, this is a really cool job. I like these people. I like what they do. It's not at all what I imagined when I was an actor. I always saw the casting director as the obstacle between the actor and the role. And it wasn't until I started interviewing these folks that I realized, oh, not at all. These are people who are on your side. They're fighting for you. They're excited to show you to producers. And uh, And that's when I started opening my mind to other ways that I could work within the industry other than on camera. I moved out here twice, so let me let me answer that question oh, okay. on two levels. One is, when I moved out here in 93, what fueled me was ignorance. I was young, I was fresh out of school, I was sure that, uh, I, you know, since I could do it in Atlanta, I could do it in L.A., and I just moved out here and said, well, great, it should just be the exact same experience except bigger. And, uh, and I was not at all prepared for the level jump that comes from working in a minor market where, you know, you may do a couple industrials, a few low-budget indie films, or, you know, occasionally non-union commercials, things like that, versus coming out here where they're producing series television and studio films, and it's just a completely different level. Uh, So ignorance is what drove me when I was out here in 93. When I moved back out here in late 98, uh, I realized that what was going to make the difference for me was uh, research. And really checking out everybody that I wanted to work with. And, and that's sort of what self-management for actors became. It was how I could have succeeded as an actor if I had only had this book, but I didn't, so here I'll give it to you guys. And it was it basically a game plan for all the research required to build decades of a career in this industry rather than just showing up and saying, well, I'm here, I've got headshots, I'm you know mildly talented, hire me, which is sort of how I approached it in 93. And it's how a lot of people approach it. They yeah, move I out here. Say, I, I think people still approach it that way. Yeah. Enter self management for actors. Let's hope that is, you know, breeding a new group of people who are, are better prepared or at least m- more prepared for the business side of things. Because, you know, craft is a given. You're, you're assumed to be baseline, very talented to move mm-hmm. out to Los Angeles and attempt a career as an actor. But then if you also have a little bit of business savvy and know how to do targeted marketing and really research which projects are the right fit for you and start building relationships from even before you move here, thanks to social networking, Mm -hmm. uh, it really can make the difference in your career starting quickly or never starting at all at this level. You know, I'm curious, even though the book is geared towards actors, I mean, have you gotten response from producers and filmmakers Absolutely. that say, I, you know, I love this book and I, I gained from this book? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's actually been picked up as a, as a textbook in film departments, not just in acting departments, but in film departments at universities and colleges mm-hmm. worldwide. It's it's one of those things where people are saying this is the, there, there's a class that a lot of film schools offer that is a, a how to work with actors class, and they're using it in that as a way to, like, here's how to wrap your brain around the experience that the actors are going to have, not just on the craft level. So yeah, I'd, I've also gotten feedback from people who aren't even in the entertainment industry saying this is just good business sense. This is good marketing. This is good, uh, you know, good common sense way to run your own small business, whatever it may be. So that's pretty cool. You know, because I, I sort of came across that 
re, you know as we did research for this mm-hmm. interview and and i'm sort of turned on to this book and i'm i'm, I'm heavily interested in, yeah, in t- taking a look at this one um this is film courage we are live in studio with casting director bonnie gillespie what, what drives you what what keeps you going day after day uh, it's just so fun you know i i, I think I think people take for granted how dang cool this gig is that we've got. Like the the fact that we get to work as storytellers and that that goes for whatever your role is in the filmmaking process. It to to be a part of the storytelling process is so cool. And there are people who okay, I don't know any filmmakers who sit around fantasizing about what it would be like to be an accountant. I know a lot of accountants who sit around fantasizing about what it would be like to work in Hollywood. You know, we've got a dream job. No, no matter what part of the job is ours, whatever our role is in the collaborative process, it's really cool. And so I think what drives me, I think what gets me fired up every day is that I am living my dream. I And, and my dream keeps recreating itself. It, it's not like I grew up saying, oh, I'm going to write for actors and, uh, you know, create uh, casting lists and and work with independent filmmakers on low budget indies and cast things like that. You know, it's not like that's what I woke up saying I was going to do one day. It's just that each day, as my life evolves and I continue to meet new people and collaborate on new projects and roll out new exciting things, like you mentioned, somebody's basement and your actor MBA. These are things that it's like I didn't. These things weren't in my life a year ago, and now I'm going. Wow, how cool that I live in a place where we can just say, hey, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Let's put our brains together and create something. Mm -hmm. And people support that. I love that. I I, I don't know many other industries where that is true of the day-to-day. Well, you've talked about something called a Plan K. I think you've written about that. Yeah. Because you say when you moved out here, you had a Plan A, which quickly turned into a Plan B and then Mm -hmm. C. And and you worked a series of survival jobs Mm -hmm. to kind of carry you through. How did you remain positive and and still have that strength to carry on because those jobs can really beat people down and, and transition into that plan K. Yeah, I, I think the key with survival jobs in, in particular is that you have to choose a job that doesn't suck your soul and a lot of people um, find that desperation drives them to take on jobs that, that may be a little soul sucking and I think you have to do whatever it takes to prevent yourself from being in those types of jobs and if for some reason you have to work a job like that you have to do whatever it takes to steel yourself against becoming bitter because uh, as a creative artist bitterness enters the room before you do and that's going to prevent you from getting the types of jobs that you actually want if your survival job is beating you down and making you resentful and instead if you look at your survival job as wow this is the thing that empowers me and enables me to do this cool acting class or to do this copy credit meals gig this weekend or whatever and then just be in a place of appreciation i think that that is the first step toward uh, staving off bitter actor syndrome interesting yeah okay um we've also seen you discuss doers versus talkers and you say doers usually get to doing way before anyone has the chance to reject them but talkers kind of keep talking and remain bitter yeah can you expand on that um it's it's interesting because as I, I, I think this may actually go back to some of that how when I came out here in 93 uh, ignorance is what what drove me and ignorance may not be the right word it was probably just naivete but it's I think that Having an action plan and doing research and, and having a plan before you jump is is essential, absolutely, or I wouldn't have written the book that talks about creating a plan. But I also think there comes a time when you just have to go do it and you have to try it. And you try it at the right level. You know, you get here and you say, wow, I'm new. Let me do some student films. Let me do some low-budget indies. Let me do some non-union or copy credit meals. Let me Let me just go out there and collaborate and start building some relationships. But the people who sit around and talk about, no, I'm not doing anything until I'm top of show guest star on a network sitcom, I'm like, dude, you can't enter at that level. You have to work up and you have to build relationships in order to make that happen and it takes time. Mm -hmm. And so I I, I hear a lot of people talk about uh, plans and how they're going to make things work, but they're not out there hustling. They're not creating their own projects. They're not putting up shorts on YouTube or you know, creating content to show people what they can do. Instead, they're just making plans. And at the end of the day, they wake up, they're 40, and they're still, you know, waiting for their SAG card or waiting for their agent. Or worse, they have an agent, and they're waiting for that person to get them into rooms rather than realizing that they're the ones who have to do that work. The agent just closes the deal. And do you think that's fear or ego 
that keeps I think it's different for everybody. Mm-hmm. I, I think for some it's ego. I think for some it's definitely fear. Probably for most it's fear. I think mm-hmm. uh, I think for some it can even be like family issues that they they feel beholden to their their family level of success, and it's kind of terrifying that they moved thousands of miles away and came out here. And so if they came out here but then still need their family back home, somehow they are serving that and those roles. Uh, rather than coming out here and being hugely successful and being the types of you know butterflies that we know they can be if they would just break out of the cocoon to use that analogy, I just I, I think there are, are so many different reasons that somebody could be blocked from success. It's I mean that's why therapy exists, I guess. Fascinating. <laughs> no, we love it. We had a question from our listener Nathaniel J. Brown. He's an actor, and he says. What do you look for on an actor's resume? What's the one thing that should stick out the most? And he says, uh, what are you looking at? What's the tool an actor has to have? Is it the real? Um, well, let's look at when I would be looking at an actor's resume. By the time I'm looking at a resume, I've already decided that an actor is the right type based on his or her headshot for the role on which he or she is submitted. So I've put out a breakdown. The type description is there. An actor is submitted. I look at their headshot, and I know that they're the right type for the role, so they stay in the mix. Then I'll open and take a look at their resume. And this is all happening electronically. This is this is not hard copy headshots and resumes we're talking about. This is all online through Actors Access or Breakdown Services. And I'll take a look at their credits to see if they are at the level this role requires. If it's a lead role or if they're going to be playing opposite, you know, let's say I've cast a, an Oscar winner in a low-budget indie film, yay me. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's happened. It's awesome. We get somebody who's going to be in every scene with that actor. I need to see certain level of credits on that, that other actor's resume to be sure that they can handle sharing the screen with an actor that way. I would also take a look at their demo reel to be sure that they have the kind of role experience that we're looking at is you know do, do they have this genre I- experience in their in their demo reel can i actually see them doing this sort of work i i don't know that there's any one thing that turns my head on a resume more than anything else um it, there can be times i'm looking for something very specific like uh, special skills or a certain amount of improv training or there are certain coaches that if i see their name in the training section i go ooh, i know what kind of training they've been going through and that means something to me mm-hmm. um but it's it's also just a certain level of are they at a supporting level uh as as an actor or are they ready to take on a, a first lead you know, there are even little nitpicky things like if I take a look at their resume and see principal misspelled, I I wonder how intelligent the person might be. And I know homonyms are tough. I get it. But <laughs> it's it's always uh, interesting to me when someone misspells a coach's name or they misspell a director's name and, they, and they're sort of treating it casually. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it just makes me wonder, do they approach their acting casually? And so uh, that seems super nitpicky, but it's something that certainly will draw my attention in the wrong way. Uh, that's good oh, to know. That's a reflection. Of their work, yeah, right. absolutely. David and I know so many super talented individuals who have invested years of working on their craft. They audition relentlessly. They have TV credits. They have film credits. Yet that big break has not come for them. Um, they haven't gotten to the point where they can sustain themselves as actors. Maybe they've had a good year here and there, but it, it's not lasting. What do you tell someone like that? Um, patience. But at that point, they've already probably exhausted their patience, you know, if, if they really have been at it that long. Uh, you know, it's, it's tough when someone's been working at it a long time and hasn't had the career traction that they anticipated they would have. You know, my first tip would be, you know, don't anticipate how, how it's going to look. You know, because if you go into it saying, I'm going to give it a year, I know so many people who move to LA and say, okay, I'm going to give it a year. I'm like, dude, you can't even learn the freeways in a year. You can't, you just can't set yourself up like that. And it, it, this is such a complicated and complex system here. And so for people to instead say, well, I'm moving to LA because that's where I'm going to live and I'm going to pursue work there. And it may be at the low budget indie level, it may be studio features, yay me. It may be, um, web TV. It may be top a show guest on a top network sitcom. Again, yay me. So you can't know, though, where your success is going to happen. And one of my, my favorite things to do is talk with actors who are self-producers, people who create their own content, because those are folks I find that if things are going slowly for them or aren't going as they anticipated when they moved here, 
they're just taking the reins of their career and saying, you know what, screw this. I'm going to show them what I can do. And they're creating content that then happens to go viral. And they don't co- start out with a plan like let the, let's have this go viral because you can't plan for that. What they do is create something to be a showcase for what they are capable of doing. Figure, put this on a reel, get this in front of agents and managers, maybe in front of casting, this would be good for me. And then it turns out to be something that people really get excited about and they pass it around. The share button is a very powerful tool. And it gets people excited and then networks are watching, production companies are watching, agents and managers are watching. There's someone on payroll at every production company and every major agency whose job it is to watch the internet. And there's a reason for that. It's because there's money to be made there. And it's because that's how people are starting to inform us who's ready for their big break. So I guess the advice I would give would be, you know, have you exhausted everything truly? Or have you only tried what, what used to be the, the way that you would get cast, which is you move to L.A., you get your headshots, you stay in classes, you get an agent or manager, get your SAG card, they submit. When they call and say you have an audition, you go. That's the old way. That way is now secondary to creating your own content and popping on the radar of the buyers. And when you say that someone looks ready, what's that vibe that someone gives off when they walk into a room? Because you've written about Mm -hmm. that before, that your kind of your vibe, your aura, whatever you want to call it, announces who you are before Mm -hmm. you you even open your mouth. What is that vibe that the actor gives off, that they're ready? I, I think it's more that they are not giving off the stench of desperation uh, it's, it's sort of like, it's like dating you know you know the date, the date with the person who just kind of leans in a little too much and who's just a little too eager and you're like man it's not going to happen you know uh, it's, it, and, and could have everything going for him but if it's, if it's just he's too eager you kind of feel uncomfortable on his behalf it's, it's a lot like that um, especially this comes back to the having the survival job that doesn't beat you down because if you show up to an audition feeling like I have to book this because if I don't I can't pay rent we feel that and we feel anxious for you remember we're all sensitive critters everybody who's in this industry we're all artists we're all creatives even if our job is to negotiate major deals we still have that side of us that is creative or we wouldn't be drawn to this industry and so because of that we're very sensitive to those vibes and when somebody walks into the room feeling hungry and desperate and needy for it we may not even understand that that's where that's coming from but we just feel this sense of oh man there's tension there's something there that is is making me uncomfortable and instead you need to make us feel like hey don't worry i got this let me show you how i act and then by us feeling that you have that confidence and don't mistake confidence for being cocky but when you come in with that confidence and the ability to then show us the work and make us comfortable that hey you got it covered Uh, then you feel like a solution to a problem, which is all casting is, finding a solution to a problem. I mean, what's great about Bonnie is she's so generous with her information, you know, and doing the research on this show. So Mm -hmm. if anyone listening, if you're coming across Bonnie for the first time, um, she's pretty extraordinary at getting back to people and and being Mm -hmm. open. So highly recommend you you find her on Facebook, that you find her on Twitter, um, and get get to know her a little bit more. Um, Let's go a little bit deeper, Bonnie. What, What... can you tell us what, what frustrates you about actors? Um, gosh, yeah, ones who don't take advantage of the resources that are out there, especially with the Internet, especially with, uh, with social networking and how many of us are making ourselves accessible to actors and, and giving free information. You know, I, I've been writing my column at Show Facts for over six years. That's, you know, over six years of weekly Archived, free and searchable columns. I mean, hundreds of thousands of words right there for you, free. Don't even have to buy my book. Buy my book, great, awesome, yay me, but you don't have to. And someone came on my Facebook wall, uh, on my fan page, uh, just I think yesterday, day before, and said, you know, I'm, I'm an actor and I'm, I'm 29 and I'm desperate and I really want to make it. And I'm like, boy, there's nothing that turns a casting director on more than just coming right out and saying you're desperate. Um, but he, uh, he talked about how uh, he had no one to help push him and he just needed to be seen and that's all he needed. So ha- see me. How do, I, how do I get seen? And I said, darling, first thing you need to do is go. And I gave him a link and I sent him to the, the, co- the first column I send everybody to if they reach out like that and say, go read that and read the links of everything that I linked up in that column and read everything. It's going to take you a few days. But when you're done, come back with follow-up questions and I'll be glad to help. He came back within two hours and said, yeah, 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 I read all that. I need someone to discover me. I need someone to see me. And I'm like, well, I can't force you to read. 
Like I, I, the information's there. There are lots of ways you can help yourself, but there are people who, well, I, the analogy I use is it's like the diet industry. Mm-hmm. Billions of dollars every year people are spending on whatever the quick fix is. No one actually wants to hear that it takes hard work and discipline over time. And that's the only thing that works consistently. But it's the same thing with the entertainment industry. You have to work hard, you have to be disciplined, and you have to spend time doing it. And if you do all that and build the relationships and research and learn who the players are and put yourself in front of, in your best light, doing the things that you you do best in front of the people who are most likely to buy what you are selling, you will succeed in this industry. But people don't want to hear that. They want to hear, well, no, how can I be on the next Friends <laughs> today? Mm-hmm. They're like, well, yeah. I, I'm not sure what kind of advice to give to somebody who comes to me and says I want to be famous because I really, I don't know. How, that's that's a magic trick. That's that's mm-hmm. not. <laughs> but I think when you talk to most actors and what I really love about actors in Los Angeles in particular, most of the people I've met really do get that they could be living their wildest dreams by being the actor whose name nobody outside the industry ever really knows, but they get stopped on the street by people who are like, wait, I know you. Oh, you're that guy in that show. Or, I know you. I saw you in that movie with, with that other guy. What's your name? Well, I, I know, I love you. I don't know who you are, but oh my God, I love you. But they recognize your work and they know they enjoy it. There are actors like that who are making tons of money and never have to worry about doing anything outside acting for the rest of their lives, but they're not household names. And I think that things like TMZ and Entertainment Tonight and Us Magazine have sort of dropped us into a world where we uh, we champion the celebrity rather than realizing that there are all these supporting players who really make the films and the TV shows possible. And, and I think if actors pay attention to that as an ambition, they're much more likely to succeed. It's a more realistic goal. Absolutely love what you're touching on there. Yeah, I, I, that's amazing. I, I was going to jump in there, but she just kept going. And oh, I was sorry. Like, you know what? No, no, no. <laughs> it was beautiful. It. it was beautiful. I was we like, I'm it. not even going to touch it. Um, is it always the most talented actor who gets the part? You know, what, what, what factors come you're, into play? You're setting me up. You know the answer to that question is, <laughs> is no. Uh, there are many times it's not the most talented actor who gets the part, and that especially comes into play on, on projects that I'm working on, the low-budget indies, where we have to get a certain number of name actors. And I use the word name actors because the industry uses the, the word name actors. It's not mine. Don't yell at me for using it. I didn't create it. Yes, I know everybody has a name, but if you are called a name actor, you are someone whose name on the marquee is going to put butts in seats. And on the low-budget indies in particular, we have to convince our investors that they're going to earn their money back in overseas sales and in distribution. And the only way to do that sometimes is to attach a certain level of name actor in the project. And so there are a lot of times that a role will go to somebody who may not be the most talented because that person helps bring us name value. Or it could even be an actor who's not considered a name actor, but who is coming on as a producer and brings in money. And that person is going to get an opportunity that someone who doesn't bring the money would get. There are a lot of factors. Uh, do you look like you could be related to the person you're supposed to be related to? So, okay, we've got someone who's more talented, but when we see her on screen with the woman who's supposed to play her mother, it's so clear they couldn't possibly be mother and daughter. Well, then we can't go with the most talented. We have to go with the most talented who also fits the bill physically. So there, there are a lot of factors with that, but you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to the actor's voice, which is truly a phenomenal column. Thank I mean, you. If, if anyone on, uh, you know, you can actually see it for free. You don't have to be on Actors Access or Show Facts. Mm-mm. You can actually just log in for free. And one post that truly stuck out to me was, one on high self-esteem low ego and you say that this is a necessary component for someone in any part of this industry yeah can you touch on that yeah um the you have to be low ego in order to handle the the ego crushing blows that sometimes come with uh, a career in this industry uh, but you have to have high self-esteem because you have to be believable that you can, or you have to be able to believe rather that you can succeed. You have to have uh, sort of a, a dual mindset about this. You have to trust that you are the most talented, most exceptional, most amazing, most wonderful badass that's ever walked in front of these people because you need that confidence to drive you. 
you also have to not have your ego tied up in whether you succeed or fail. And I guess I, I really shouldn't even say succeed or fail because to me it's whether you get that job or not because that's not success or failure. That's all the pursuit. you got to be down with the pursuit in this industry because that's what you're going to be doing most of all is pursuing. And if you can get down with the pursuit, then you can have career longevity and you'll get parts and you won't get parts. And it's not success or failure. It's not that you did a good job or a bad job. It's just the way it goes. And sometimes you weren't the right fit and sometimes you were and sometimes you were the right fit and then the money fell out and you didn't get to do the job anyway. You know, there, there are all sorts of factors. And if your ego's tied up in that, that leads to bitter actor syndrome. If instead your self-esteem is very high and your ego is on the low side, you can bounce back from that stuff very easily uh, when it doesn't go the right way, but also always believe that it will go the right way. So I'm curious, what is the cure for bitter actor syndrome? Once you cross that line, can you go back? <laughs> <laughs> lots of spa days, <laughs> massages, uh, lots of uh, retreat type behavior, uh -huh. meditation, Re saging. Uh, you bet, you bet. <laughs> Read outliers start to finish. You know, I mean, there, there are a whole lot of ways that you can, I think, reboot. Uh, I, I call it a, a soul reboot. And sometimes you just need that. And, and I, I think that artists in particular uh, need to watch out for becoming bitter. And when, that, when they come anywhere close to it, do whatever it takes. You know, go, go fishing. Take, take, you know, hang up the sign. You know, don't check your email. Don't tweet. Don't, you know, just disconnect from everybody if that's what it takes. And really get clear again on why you're pursuing this. Because I think if you come back to the why, like why are you in this, I think that fixes a lot. And if your motives are to be, become famous, okay, that's all right. I don't you know, necessarily align with that one, but I think as long as you, whoever you are, are working on a path that you're aligned with, everything goes okay. And what bitterness comes from is feeling so off path from, from where your heart and soul truly is to get a little woo-woo. Wow, no, I know. like it. Okay. <laughs> love it. Abs Thank absolutely you. love it. I'm I'm trying to gather my thoughts here. I'm, 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 totally, I'm totally loving it. Take a it. moment. <laughs> let's, let's, let's all, let's Talk all take a moment. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll all take a moment here. <laughs> um, I can't help but thinking of when I took acting class. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of my guy, Michael Whaley, yes, who was my Michael acting guy. teacher. Um, and, you know, and, and he would talk about, um, you know, casting directors and, and casting assistants. Um, you know, here, here's what he would recommend. He would recommend becoming friendly with casting assistants, mm -hmm. you know, number one is because casting directors are very tough to pin down. They're, they're extremely busy. Number two is that the assistants would one day be casting directors themselves. And, and this kind of touches on the fact of you have to be thinking long term. I love how your proponent of like, you're not just going to come out here and it's just going to magically happen. You have to be thinking long term. You have to think like, I'm here to have a career in this yep. business. Uh, my question to you, are there any actors you form relationships with early on in your career that you still cast today. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, there there are people who read for me on the very first feature film I cast, which would have been the summer of 2003. It was a $25,000 budget indie film, the SAG Experimental Contract, a contract so bad it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was just tiny, tiny, tiny budget film, and there's an actor who auditioned for me. There's several actors, actually, who auditioned for me on that when I was, you know, who the heck are you? Brand new casting director. You know, most of them had known me as a writer for Backstage West, or they knew me as an actor who was out auditioning with them five years earlier. And here I am putting out a breakdown. And the fact that they were like, well, what the hell? We'll go. Came in and auditioned for me then. They get offers from me now on the $2 million budget indies. And, you know, and I'm still at the beginning of my game. I've only been casting seven and a half years. So, you know, I'm still new. It is. I love how you say that. Seven and a half years. I'm still new. I hope hope everyone's taking note of that. Yeah, you bet. Well, especially if you move here and figure you got 50 years ahead of you in this business, in this place. Yeah, mm. you bet. I'm I'm a fraction of the way through my casting career and 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 learning something new on every project, which I love because I'm collaborating with people who have a different set of problems at a different budget level or a different uh, confidence of financing level. You know, and all the things that, it, that go with indie film. Um, but the, the people who showed up for me on those early, early projects and did a great job and didn't treat it like some crappy, low-budget budget independent film, but instead treated it like, hey, this is a great opportunity and let me show Bonnie what I can do, those are the people that I still love the most and bring in as often as I can now. You bet. 
We have this question in from Terry Reed. Um, any insight on the process of getting name actors, here we go with the name actors, mm-hmm. interested on a project so you can get financiers and or producers, studios, directors interested um, would be appreciated beyond the obvious know someone part of the equation. Yeah, and actually I wouldn't even go with the know someone as being the first the first thing that wasn't even the first thing that would pop into my mind. So I'm, I'm glad that's obvious to some, but to me the most obvious is the material has to be amazing. The script has to be fan Fantastic, and I am not kidding. And I know everybody thinks their baby is perfect. Believe me, there are a lot of bad scripts out there. I've read most of them. It is my casting philosophy. This is I said this when when I started casting in 2003. I said I'm going to use this business model: amazing projects with rock star crews. Go after actors who aren't in it for the money. That's it. That's the formula for Cricket Feet Casting, and that's how I've built my business. And I am so proud that I chose that business model seven and a half years ago because I really have a track record of work that I'm very proud of. And it's because every script that I put in front of agents and managers is a pleasure to read. It's clean. It's tight. It's formatted correctly. It doesn't have subtext written in the dialogue. It doesn't have subtext written in the stage directions. It doesn't have uh, incorrect your or its or any of those crazy making things and I know again this sounds really nitpicky but on a film that's maybe only two million dollars if I'm sending that script out to CAA I have to promise that agent who covers me look it's not gonna suck even if it's not your favorite genre it's gonna be a great read and anything that would take somebody out of the moment so misspellings or formatting errors or just newbie mistakes that you know people screenwriters just overlook is is something that has to be taken out before it goes in front of the agents and managers because we're hoping that they're going to give us access to their highest level name talent on a project that doesn't have a lot of money or may have none of its funding. And I can't build a reputation as a casting director putting something in front of somebody that I'm not proud of. And so that that to me is the most obvious thing that has to be the the script has to be amazing the team has to have a track record if there are some short films they've done together if they've got festival cred because they won some awards on a on a short before and then this is their first feature i work with a lot of first-time feature directors who have a great short that did very well on the festival circuit or even made it through the academy qualifying process um i think that's awesome because if i have something i can show them and say hey look while we're putting this offer in front of your name actor, here, let me show you the, the stuff that these guys were able to do on $5,000, and this time we got $2 million. And they go, wow, that's really good. And the script's tight, and the offer is good. You have to have enough money to make an offer. Um, and I'm not, I, I specialize in, in not having to do pay or play offers. I'm very lucky with that because I work on such strong material. But you do have to have enough money that if they say yes, you're ready to escrow that so that you can get them attached and get that letter of intent and then take that to the investors and get them to open their wallets wider. I know this system inside and out. It is a dance. It is a lot about reputation. It's a lot about trust. And for me to be able to say to agents, trust me, this is a great project, starts with a fantastic script and a great crew. Because I want thank you notes from everybody on that set. I want everybody to say these are the best actors we've ever worked with, and I want the actors to thank me for putting them with that crew. And I get that. Mm-hmm. Really important. It's all wow. about the building of the relationships, especially at the low budget level, because nobody's in it for the money. Mm-hmm. Well, on a similar vein, we have a question that came in from Conrad Steve. I believe he's listening. Hello, Conrad. And he says, I do have a question in regards to ask, asking acting talent to defer their pay on my projects since I am uncomfortable to make such requests. How best to approach this thorny issue when I am directing micro-budget p- productions, regardless if I am in Canada or elsewhere? Okay, well, that starts with your team. You hire a casting director, and that's someone you pay. You, you don't ask that person to defer her payments because she's going to be working really hard and getting you a lot of people attached who can make your film happen. And so that's, that's someone who... You don't scrimp on the money for the casting director. But because what that does is then that allows the casting director to lean on relationships that already exist to get talent to work below scale or for deferred payments, uh, depending on the contract that's in place. And so then the director isn't the one making the uncomfortable request. It's the casting director's job, and the casting director's dealing with agents, and it's their job. They're used to having these conversations, and they have shorthand. So you trust that you have surrounded yourself with a team who can make these requests less unpleasant. Mm-hmm. You know, l- Let's go back to our, our good actors for a second. If, if you had a pep talk with an actor before their audition Coach Gillespie 
<laughs> I, I, I was just going to say, how, how how would you coach them? I mean, what what would you say to them? Oh, it's you know, the shortest. It's the shortest speech ever. Have fun. Don't suck. <laughs> That's it. That is all the advice I give to actors before an audition because you all have your own processes. You all have your own way of approaching material, and I don't ever want to micromanage the process of how an actor gets to a certain place with a role or with certain material. That's not my job. But what I do want to do is just remind them we want to see people who are having fun and we expect that you don't suck. So if you accomplish those two goals, then that's that's all we need. And it may not be that we can cast you in this project right now, but you've come in showing us that you have a good time, you've made some strong choices, you understand material, and you're a good actor, we'll call you in again. And then that's talking about the relationship building process, the most essential part. So we always focus on what actors are doing wrong in an audition. What mistakes have you seen directors make during uh, the casting process? I've seen directors who don't really know how to talk with actors. You know, people who uh, did really well in film school learning about all the technical components but never had a class in how to have a conversation with a, a creative critter with a soft underbelly, you know. <laughs> and I think that'd be a really good class in film school. Uh, and I ha- I've seen that offered, uh, and it's being offered more and more, which is w- at the top of the interview where I talked about my book being a part of the, the film school curriculum lately. That's, that's where that's coming in. Um, but I, I think that the, the biggest mistake I've seen a- directors make in sessions with actors would have to be just not being able to communicate or articulate exactly what it is they want from them in a language that the actors can understand. But then again, that's part of my job, is to then sort of translate and say, okay, here's what he's actually looking for, and help the actor get there or give them words that maybe the director isn't coming up with but that I know he means because we've had six weeks of conversations about how this role should look. You know, we've had a few guests here, uh, um, Bonnie, that, that have as much, you know, may, may, or I should say not, 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 as, not that many guests have as much going on in their lives as, as you do. Um, yeah. And uh, we've mm-hmm. touched on a little bit here. I want to do something sort of fun here. Okay. I want to try this. Can you do us a small favor? And, and, and can you just kind of highlight just a handful of the ventures that you're you're involved with right now? Sure. Okay. There's the casting. Got a couple projects going on right now that I'm very excited about. We attached Peter Fonda in A Long Tomorrow, which is a $2 million indie film uh, that we'll be shooting later this year in, uh, well, it was going to be South Carolina, but it's now looking like Connecticut because they've got some incentives. So we will nice. see nice. where that goes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's in the air right now. Um, But I think the thing I'm probably most excited about right this instant is Your Actor MBA because at youractormba.com, we're going to launch content tomorrow. So right now, if you go to that URL, there's nothing. You can go to our fan page, but until tomorrow, there there is no content. And as of tomorrow, there will be lots of content and more and more and more. This is going to be a uh, a, a course, an online course, video-based with uh, experts from all sorts of areas of the industry. We have agents, managers, casting execs, showrunners, directors, actors you'd recognize, image consultants, money management experts, all, all sorts of branding people who are going to meet with us on a weekly basis to talk with actors about how they can control the business part of their career. And there's nothing like this that currently exists on the web, so I'm really excited about it. And it's a collaboration that uh, I'm a part of with Marcy Learoff, who's a casting legend, and Mitchell Fink, who's a wonderful working actor who also does uh, marketing consultant uh, work with actors. Mm-hmm. And so I'm real excited about that because it's launching soon, and I've been putting all my energy into that. Uh, Somebody's Basement is a website that we launched in May, and the idea behind that is if you get the right people together creating their own content, like a band in somebody's basement, you can have some really amazing stuff. So rather than self-producing actors having to have their work compete with Hamster on a Piano at YouTube and try to you know somehow rise above the millions of videos that are there, it's a place where each day, weekdays, we put up another piece, and it is that—that that is the one piece that's being showcased on our site that day, and it's all independently produced content, and uh, that's very exciting. Very, very pleased with that. You know, you touched on some good things. Let me, because you know, because I know you can keep going and keep mm-hmm. going. You're involved in so many projects. Right. What, I, what I, I just had this idea. You know, let, let's imagine that everything you do is sort of piled together like a like a game of Jenga. Okay. How how many blocks would we be able to pull away before it just at all just comes collapsing down? I mean, it, is it so vital for you to have your your hands in so many pots? Hmm. It's interesting because I I don't see the configuration as as Jenga in something that's going <laughs> tall and skinny. I actually see it as something that's going very flat and very 
wide reaching. Mm -hmm. So I think because I lay my Jenga tiles out (laughs) pretty low to the ground, I can have a whole bunch of them because if you take one away, you're just moving it and putting it somewhere else. It's not a support for anything else. None of the projects that I work on uh, hinges on the success or failure of any of the other projects. It's everything is, is sort of its own thing. One thing I'm ninja good at is compartmentalizing. And it's kind of terrifying to people who don't have brains that work like that, but I'm really good at just focusing on here's the one thing that I'm doing right now, and then when it's time to stop focusing on that, I go and focus on this other thing. And I'm, I'm really good at not being distracted while I'm in that space. Mm. And so because of that, I don't think that there's any one thing that the success of all these projects hinges on other than you know my ridiculous ability to not sleep. Uh, social media, how has it enhanced your career efforts? Well, it's interesting. I think MySpace probably did the most to make a big jump for me with my column. And so I'm stretching back to like 2006 now. Mm-hmm. Um, I had had found out what my numbers were on my column, and they were impressive. But I said, you know what, we can do better. And so I joined MySpace, and I started promoting my column at MySpace and tripled my readership within three months. And I said, yeah, that's right. That's what we got to do. We got to put the word out because people, once they find it, will read it. But there, there, there was no real advertising for it, so I said, "Well, I'll just I'll use social networking to make that happen." So that's where I noticed the biggest impact back in two thousand six, two thousand seven. Um, what Facebook has done is allow me to get to know some folks better before I meet them for the first time, and I found that to be very interesting in in casting situations because I'll meet someone maybe even at a networking function, not even in a casting session, but I've known them through their comments and their status updates on Facebook or on Twitter and then find okay they're not they're not a whacker they're actually pretty normal okay cool guy all right you're not creepy at all and then i meet in person and go no you're not creepy at all very cool and so it's sort of a nice um, a nice way to make sure that there are no blind dates interesting as everything okay. gets vetted a little bit and you started a blog didn't you years ago um, I've been blogging since 1998 before That's it was called was. blogging. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I had a, uh, my favorite ex boyfriend uh, has a server, private server where he was running uh, journals for us. And then when Blogger launched, we all went over to Blogger software and then from there to. Uh, movable type and now to WordPress and so that's that's been going on forever and it really is just my journaling which is I always write I always have my mom when I was growing up would say my daughter the writer and I would yell and scream and stomp my foot and say I'm an actress don't call me a writer I thought it was such an insult and of course later when I realized wow looking at my tax statement and how much money I earn as a writer I go wow mom was right I'm a writer <laughs> um, and, and of course I, I knew that long before I was getting paid to do it but uh, but mom was right very nice. You know, there's two things we knew coming into the show. Number one, that it was going to be tremendous. And yes. number, number two, that it was going to go by too fast. Yes. Yeah. Both you know? things have happened. <laughs> we should just uh, f- end on a final note. Do you have a question for our audience? And if, if you do, we'd like to pose it on uh, Facebook. I would love to know what you're doing to prepare yourself. for This is for actors. What you're doing to prepare yourself for the opportunity to be seen when you have to tape yourself. Uh, that's something that is a, is a trend that's happening more and more. I'm seeing actors getting an opportunity to put themselves on tape and sort of doing pre-reads before we're inviting people into the session room. And I think as constraints of budget come, we're going to see more and more of that. And as technology gets cheaper for actors to buy, you know, the, the, for the cameras to... I, my favorite audition, I saw an actor shoot from his cell phone camera. And so I know it's possible to do. I'm, I'm noticing now a difference in the actors who are ready to embrace that and shoot their own stuff and they're putting themselves on tape for everything versus those who are like that's not my job I'm not going to do that and and so I want to know what are you doing to prepare yourself so that you're ready for that next wave of uh, of the casting process okay very nice well we've been speaking with author producer and casting director Bonnie Gillespie to find out more on Bonnie well there's many places you can go to cricketfeet.com Twitter at Bonnie Gillespie, Facebook.com slash Cricket Feet. You can also go to spynotebook.org slash Bonnie. And also your actor MBA, Somebody's Basement, and HollywoodHappyHour.com. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks you so for having much, me. Bonnie. This has been a blast, guys.